that are in A or B or both. That means for any object Y we have Y belongs to A union B if and only if Y belongs to A or Y belongs to B. This for is inclusive or you know this. So that's what is uh, that's what the third uh, fourth axiom is. It postulates that for any two given states, their union exists and is also a set. Okay, that that is the important thing. It is also a set. So once we follow these axioms, we will show ultimately that we will not run into Russell's paradox. That will be resolved. Although some more axioms will be needed for that, but nevertheless, if we follow these axioms, then we won't have the uh, problem of calling some collection a set. We will know exactly when a collection is a set. Okay, then to illustrate this concept, there is a very simple example. Let's have a look at that. Example 3, 1, 11. Example 3, 1, 11. What was 3, 1, 10? Oh, that was another example. Okay. So it just simply says that the union of these two sets is Since we have already seen these things many times in knife set theory, we are not uh, going to say anything more than this. You already know what this means. Next, there is a remark. Uh, this remark is important, although it may seem obvious or even uh, unnecessary. 3, 1, 12. You see, this um, concerns the definition of equality of sets. Do you remember when we, in after defining equality of sets in definition 314, we said something about reflexivity, symmetry, transitivity, and the substitution axiom. It, it concerns this substitution axiom. We, what are we doing? We are discussing or we are exploring the class of all sets. In that class, so far we have got three rules. Sets are objects. There is an empty set and for uh, there are singleton sets and pair sets. This, uh, besides these three rules, we have also defined a concept of equality of sets on that class. Now, as we have already seen, the axiom of substitution says that whenever we introduce some function on this class or some relation on this class, that has to satisfy the axiom of substitution. Otherwise, that thing which we define, the function or relation, whatever it is, that will not be well defined. For example, we saw that if we try to define something like the first element of a set, that does not satisfy the axiom of substitution. As such, that is not well defined. We can also understand why it is not well defined. Because uh, in a set, order of elements does not matter. So a set can be written in several different ways. If at all, we can list the elements but then its first element will change, but the state will remain same. So that's why that is not well defined. So now we have defined actually an operation, right? Union. So we have to see that it is well defined in the sense that it satisfies the axiom of substitution. The uh, 
thing that we have to check is very easy. We are not actually going to do it here, but we will just mention. I will leave it to you to do. So it just says this. Given sets A, A prime and B, we can show that if A is equal to A prime, then A union B is equal to a prime union B. Right. If these two sets are equal, then taking their union with some fixed set uh, gives me the same set. Similarly, if B prime is a set such that B is equal to B prime, such that B is equal to B prime, then A union B is equal to A union B prime. Verification of these simple things I am leaving to you. Hence, the operation union when we say operation union it is defined on a class of objects for us that class of objects is the class of sets union satisfies the axiom of substitution See, whenever we are mentioning the axiom of substitution, it's almost always the case that verification of that is rather easy, almost obvious, but it may not be obvious. In some pretty complicated class of objects, we may have some complicated definition of equality. With respect to that, verification of the substitution axiom may be non-trivial. Okay, we should ne never let our guard down. Always be logical and uh, be careful about these things. Okay, a simple mistake, if you if left unchecked, it can uh, blow up into into a disaster later. Okay, so uh, satisfy the axiom of substitution, and hence is well defined. This remark is simple but very important. Okay. Now, having defined this, naturally properties of union come after this. So that appears as lemma. Lemma 3, 1, 13. The good thing about these things is that since most of these things we have already proved in knife set theory, so we can leave many of them. So that's what we are going to do here. Let me just state this. If A, wait, have I left out something? No. If A, B and C are sets, hmm. then this pair set is equal to the union of these two singleton sets. No, what, what the hell have I written? 
excuse me, this is not what I wanted to write. If A and B are objects, any objects, then the pair set is equal to this union. If A, B and C are sets, then we have A union B is equal to B union A. You already know this is commutative law. A union B union C is equal to union of A and B union C. Associative law. There are some simply other laws also. A union A is equal to A, which is also equal to A union the empty set equal to the empty set union A. Okay. And this same thing. The exercise, this same question, this thing appears as the third exercise, which we are not solving. Why? Because we have already solved these things in life set theory. So for us, we it's already done, already proved. Now the important point is this: these things we are familiar with. However, look at this. If we prove this, then using this axiom, the fourth axiom of pairwise union and the singleton set axiom, I can now prove that the pair set axiom is a consequence. How? If I am given two objects A and B, the singleton set axiom tells me that these two collections are sets. Then I can use the pair set axiom, I, I mean sorry, the pairwise union axiom to form this union. Then this is a set that is guaranteed by this axiom. And this lemma proves that this set is nothing but the pair set. So that's how existence of pair set follows from existence of singleton sets and pairwise union. So that way this also is a consequence of singleton set. Okay, so that I wanted to draw your attention to this. Now, because of this uh, associative law, because of associativity, this expression is unambiguous. It has a link because no matter what way we choose to bracket this expression, that gives me the same result, same set. This is unambiguous. After this, there is a remark. One fourteen. Okay, and this remark says that although union and addition are operations that are somewhat similar, similar in what sense they are similar? They are both commutative 
both associative, things like that. However, they are applied on different classes of objects. We have seen addition on the class of all natural numbers, which is also a step. However, the operation of union we are defining on the, we have defined on the class of all sets. So that's why, it, uh, despite the, uh, their similarity, uh, we have to be careful. I mean, it may look something really easy and trivial, obvious. However, uh, to someone who is working with unions for the first time, it's not uncommon to make mistakes, and mistakes can arise like this. So let me just formally write the thing. Although the operations union and addition are similar in the sense that they have similar algebraic properties are similar they are not the they are not the same thing Whereas, these expressions are meaningful, these are not. Addition pertains to numbers and union pertains to steps. Unless, of course, by addition we mean something else. Right now, for us, there is only one addition, addition of natural numbers. We don't know anything about any, any other addition or something. We even don't know anything about vector addition. Okay, we, we take the view that unless something is presented to us, we will not we don't have it actually, formally or logically. Sure, we may use some things which we already know, but then that will be accompanied by the word informal. Okay, informal means we are just taking the help uh, of some prior knowledge to understand something which has not been formally presented. Once we have formally presented something, we are ready to use it in proofs and solutions. Okay, so this is not. So this distinction should be kept in mind, no matter how silly it looks. Okay, now we are in a post -grade. You may have seen me going to that part. Uh, I mean. <clears throat> again and again. It's because uh, I keep my PC open. It provides a background noise to drown out some noise that are coming from outside. So now we are in a position to define triplet sets quadruplet sets, etc. That is sets having three elements, four elements and so on. For given objects A, B, C, D we define
this thing. Note that uh, we have we haven't actually seen sets like this. We have seen, of course, but not in this formal presentation. This the meaning of this now can be given by using by union operation and the singleton set uh, axiom. And likewise, this quadruplet set having four elements can be defined like this. Okay, so the problem of defining sets having more and more elements seems to have been addressed. Okay, seems to have been solved. However, there is one more problem. Actually, many more problems that we want to solve, which will uh, require us to lay out uh, more axiom. So one problem is that, but we still cannot construct a set having n elements. Let me review this marker. Give me a moment. So although we can define sets with say 10 or 15 elements where the number is some fixed given number but we are still not in a position to define a set with an arbitrary number of elements finite but arbitrary having n elements or any natural number n why? Because this would require uh, iterating this operation of union n times because that requires starting or performing the operation union n times and we have not come across in full iteration of an operation yet. Because of this reason, we still cannot uh, define or construct axiomatically a set having n elements where n is any natural number. Similarly, We cannot construct a set having infinitely many elements yet. 
because that would require even the um, more vague uh, concept of iterating the union operation infinitely many times. Iterating the union operation infinitely many times is something we are not sure sure of in the sense that it can be done logically. So we can create arbitrarily long sets, large sets. Uh, arbitrary large sets means uh, having a fixed number of elements but not in this sense and definitely not in this sense okay infinite sets are still not they still have not uh, made an entry into our set theory our sets are still finite and quite small so the more axioms we introduce, the richer the class of sets becomes for us because it will have more and more elements. So all of them are sets. Okay. Nevertheless, uh, setting that aside, we now define something. New, new means uh, nothing will be new here unless we get to the uh, ending parts, I mean, uh, the ones which settles the which settles the Russell's paradox. In those parts, we will see new things. Other things we have already seen in nine set theory. So, this definition, uh, this is of subsets which you already know. Let A and B be sets. We say A is a subset of B. written like this. Okay. Tau write, writes like this. The same thing Hurstein will write like this. So when we are discussing analysis, we will use this. When we are discussing algebra, we will use this. Written this. If Every element of A is also an element of B. That is, for any object X, X belongs to A implies X belongs to B. That's the definition of a subset, or uh, of one set being a subset of another set. We say A is a proper subset of B if A is a subset of B and a is not equal to B. This fact 
is denoted by writing or uh, is it that uh, other notation or oh, denoted by writing this symbol strike the uh, horizontal bar out not the whole thing okay don't write like this this means something else this means a is not a subset of b this means a is a subset of b and a is not equal to b okay be careful that this striking bar does not touch this part okay, so that's the definition of a um, subset and proper subset so again you see on the class of sets we have now again introduced a relation now it's not an operation but a relation we have to here also we have to check that the that this obeys the axiom of substitution. So, for that there is a remark. So, this is remark 3116. Since the definition of subsets uses only the relation this relation is an element of relation for which or which has already been seen to obey the axiom of substitution The relation is a subset of obeys the axiom of substitution. In other words, this is well defined. We will have, we won't come across a problem that involves this concept of subsets. Hence, This relation is well defined on the class of all sets. See, now we are clever. We are not saying set of all sets. We are saying class of all sets because we don't know whether that is a set or not. We don't care. Now the next example, the next item is an example, it illustrates this relation with some simple uh, cases, 3, 1, 17. So what this says is this, this step 1, 2, 4 is a subset of 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. In fact, 
it is not just a subset, it is a proper subset. Why? Because it's a subset and these two are not equal. This one has the element 5 which is not there in this set. Note that A is a subset of A and the empty set is a sorry empty set is also a subset of A for any set A. The author asks one. We know the answer. We have seen this in ninth set theory, so I believe it. Okay, if the answer is available there. Right. Now, this notion of is a subset of this relation behaves somewhat like the ordered relation on the natural numbers. Um, and the result that states this precisely is proposition 3118. 